What a wonderful way to call us to worship this morning. Welcome to worship here at First Baptist Church. We're glad you're here. I'm glad to see each of you here. I know we have guests today, and you are welcome also. Glad you are here. There are guest cards in the pews in front of you. If you take that and fill that out and put it in the offering plate in the center of the sanctuary as you leave. We're not passing offering plates yet. So if you'll do that, we'd appreciate it. Welcome to worship this morning. Again, we're glad to have Jack Pennington with us. It's wonderful to have a pastor emeritus who is available to preach. It's wonderful to have him here and to have Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. Would you take your bulletin? Let's read together our call to worship, or listen as I read the call to worship. God has lavished us with every perfect gift from above and called us to living intimacy through the beloved one, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Each week we come to God with our time of confession. You'll take your bulletin for that. And as you do that today, think about what you personally want to speak to God about. We read together, but also it's about us individually as we join together. Let us confess our sins to our loving God who calls us close through our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Join me in responsively reading the prayer of confession. Loving, righteous God, our hearts are defiled with the wickedness you hate. You have called us to yourself, but we have gone away. Forgetting your living word, we cling to dead traditions. Hypocrites, we honor you with our lips, while our hearts are far from you. Amen. We are so grateful that God forgives. Our generous God has given us the perfect gift of forgiveness, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has liberated us from dead tradition and made, a new, made us new by the living word, filling our hearts with God's love.
Our first reading today is from the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter. Brothers and sisters, if a person is caught doing something wrong, you who are spiritual should restore someone like this with a spirit of gentleness. Watch out for yourselves so you won't be tempted too. Carry each other's burdens so you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are important when they aren't, they're fooling themselves. Each person should test their own work and be happy with doing a good job and not compare themselves with others. Each person will have to carry their own load. Those who are taught the word should share all good things with their teacher. Holy Gospel of our Lord according to Luke. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus and said, Teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus replied, What is written in the law? How do you interpret it? And he responded, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you, you've answered it correctly. Do this and you will live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. And so he said to Jesus, and just who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him up, and left him near death. It just so happened that a priest was also going down the same road when he saw the injured man, crossed over to the other side, and went on his way. A Levite came by that spot, saw the injured man, crossed over to the other side of the road, and went on his way. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came to where the man was. When he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him, bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine. Then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two full days' worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, take care of him, and when I return, I will pay you back for any additional costs. What do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered thieves? The legal expert said the one who demonstrated mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Let's pray. God above us, God before us, God within us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, come now. Be a bridge between us over which your truth may pass. Amen. Fred Rogers, the children's entertainer for many years on PBS, was also a seminary graduate, and you probably know that, went to Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and he used to speak at a lot of adult seminars where he would tell the adults how they should talk to children about all the violent stories that they see on the news. He said he was a child and he was afraid when he saw scary things on the news. And his mother said to him, look for the helpers, Fred. You'll always find God in the people who are helping. So Fred would tell his adult audiences, the helpers are always there. Direct your children's attention to the helpers. Well, that's what Jesus is doing in our parable today. He's doing that very same thing. I don't think he's knocking these other two men, the priest and the Levite. Preachers spend too much time doing that. 
Jesus didn't condemn anyone, knock anyone. So they might have been going to get help for all we know. I don't know. What he does is he draws attention to the helper, not the priest and the Levite, but to the helper. Now, you know that because there's three verses about that one man, that Samaritan. That's where the attention goes. He's doing what he can, uses oil and wine to bathe the wounds, tears up his own garments to make bandages, takes this man to an inn, stays with him through the night, and pays for his continued recuperation even says, if he has to stay here longer, I'll pay for it. Jesus is saying, look at the helper. There was a little uh, squib in the newspapers a few years ago about a, a man who was traveling with his wife overseas, and he became deathly ill, and they needed to get back to the United States. So they were having problems doing it because they lost a credit card and they were having trouble getting plane tickets to return. They tried to wire, have money wired, but that was taking too long. And so the woman was standing begging the agent, here, take our tickets and exchange them for another flight. Well, that wasn't going well. All of a sudden, a man she'd never seen before nudged up behind her and said, here, you're going to need some extra expenses. And she opened her hand, and he placed a wad of bills and turned and walked off before she could say a thing. She was stunned. She opened her hand. It was five $1,000 bills. This wealthy man, very wealthy man, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to help, and did that help? She later told the reporter who wrote the story, I think he was an angel. We never know who the angels are, but they're the helpers. And according to Jesus, that's who God made us to be. So one of the things I like so much about the movie uh, October Sky, it was a movie made several years ago down in Oliver Springs, which is six miles from Oak Ridge. And it's, it's about a poor coal mining town in West Virginia where all the boys dropped out of high school when they were 15 or 16 years old so they could go work in the mines. But there was a teacher there who wanted something better for those boys in her class. And so she tried to plant dreams in their minds and in their hearts. And one of those dreams took root in a boy who began to dream about building rockets. And he got three of his friends together and they went to work on those rockets and people didn't understand what they were up to and they had a lot of failures in the process and their own families thought they were wasting time. It discouraged them. Their friends thought they were crazy. But they won the science fair. And if you win the science fair, you get to go to the state science fair. So they took their rockets to the state science fair and they won the state science fair. Well, now you get to go to the national science fair. Who would have thought that? They went there and they won the whole thing. All four of them got full scholarships into college and a ticket out of poverty. And that uh, young man who had the dream, he became a rocket scientist for NASA. Now, that's a true story. And something like that happens only because somebody was a helper. 
somebody made a huge difference in those four boys' lives. When we were leaving that movie, I remember thinking, since I used to be a teacher, I remember thinking, I wish every teacher in America could see this movie. I don't think that anymore. I wish everybody could see that movie. If you haven't read it, it's a wonderful movie because it tells us we all make a difference in the lives of other people. Paul gives you an example. He says, well, I, well here's something you can do. Forgive people who nobody else is forgiving and do it in a spirit of gentleness. And he said, you can bear one another's burdens. That's the way you can be a helper. Robert Bella wrote a couple of books that John Claypool recommended to me, so they were on my, in my library for years before I retired and gave them away, gave all my books to somebody else to be blessed by them. Those two books I remember, one of them was called Habits of the Heart, and the other one was called The Good Society, and, and what those books told you was that Americans are becoming more and more individualized. That is, we think of our own pleasures only without much thought about other people's needs. Bella says it, it, it's a time when people are asking like never before. Well, what's in it for me? He says that staggering growth in our cities coupled with this concern for self, has turned us inward, made us thoughtless of others. We've seen so much pain on television, we've learned to be immune to it, to not even notice it. Against all that, here comes this story, this story we've read so many times before. On a difficult week like this week, here comes this story, and it tells us something very important. You know what it is? He tells you your life is not just about you. The life you were born with, the life God gave you, the life you are living is not just about you. It's bigger than that. I heard a woman at a conference tell a story years ago that has stayed with me. It's about a rat that lived in the walls of a farmer's house. And one day the rat peeped out through his rat hole in the wall and he saw the farmer opening a package and he was horrified, absolutely horrified, because the package was a rat trap. So in a panic, he called all the council of animals together and he told them, there's a rat trap in the house. And they said, okay. And he said, rat trap in the house. And they said, okay. He's a rat trap in the house. They couldn't get him to hush. He was so excited about that. The chicken uh, scratched around a little bit and said, listen, Mr. Rat, chickens don't get caught in rat traps. What do I care about that? And the chicken walked away. And the goat said, well, that's beyond me, brother rat, but I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll pray for you. How's that? Y'all be careful now, you hear? and the goat walked away. The cow just chewed on her cud for a while and thought about it and said, you know, I can't see that this is my problem. You know, if I ever saw a rat trap, I'd just stomp it. And she walked away. Later that night, the trap went off and there was a scream in the farmer's house. A poisonous snake had crawled into the house 
and gotten caught into the trap. Farmer's wife went where the trap was and where the noise was and bent over to try to see what it had caught. And when she did, that poisonous snake bit her. It bit her and she was in a world of trouble. They tried to rush her to the hospital, but the hospital was too far away and it took too long and she didn't make it. Well, the farmer was just stunned to lose your spouse like that. He was stunned, he was shocked. And his next door neighbor, his best friend came over and said, I'll be with you, I love you, I care for you. You're, you got company, you need some chicken soup. That'll make you feel good. Where are your chickens? <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Chicken. The next day, all the neighbors came, as people do in a rural neighborhood. And he was so grateful that they came. He said, y'all stay for, for, for lunch. He said, fix the goat. The goat, goodbye. Finally, on the day of the funeral, all of his relatives from out of state and everybody flooded in and there wasn't a thing way to feed them unless they fed them beef. Goodbye, Miss Cow. You know, none of them thought it was their problem. Aha, the whole point of the little story is nobody has a problem that's not your problem. Not my problem. Nobody has a problem anywhere that is not our problem. And that's the point of Jesus' story. The good news is helpers know that. And they know how to care. And when they do, people say, I, I think he was an angel. She must have been an angel because you are a real messenger of God when you do something for somebody else. Life really isn't just about you. You and I are living in hard times right now. I don't need to tell you that. In Knoxville and around the country, ICU nurses are leaving the profession they are retiring. They are finding other work. They are burned out, completely burned out from working day and night for nearly two years on a pandemic that people refuse to be vaccinated for. They just can't take it anymore. They're quitting. A lot of pastors, ministers of music, finding something else. They didn't buy into this. It's frustrating. It's hard on people who work with the public. Senseless, evil killing in Afghanistan amazes me that somebody would tie a bomb to himself so he could kill a lot of other people. It's beyond, it's beyond insanity. It's, um, it's Stone Age idiocy. We have to see that. We have to see that on TV. Wildfires completely consuming the West. They're everywhere out West, destroying homes, animals, property, terrible floods. Just down in Middle Tennessee last week, people killed by floods. They had no idea it was going to flood. Just had a lot of rain. Here came the flood. They're dead. How does things like that happen? And hurricanes? We're having more hurricanes, stronger hurricanes than ever before. Already had three and it's just August. My goodness. My gracious, hurricanes, it's gonna be bad. 
had a, three people last week say to me, Jack, where is God? Where is God in all of this? I couldn't think of a better answer. First I thought, well, somewhere far away. And then I remembered Fred Rogers' mother. So I said, look for the helpers. There's God. God is in those helpers, and that's where you'll see him. That, I think, is the only place you'll find God in times like this. You'll find him in, in the helpers. I want to do something that Fred used to do when he would speak at public gatherings. I want you to take 40 seconds, just in quietness, bow your head if you wish, but take 40 seconds and think about someone who helped you become who you are today. Someone who helped make you who you are. Just take 40 seconds, I'll time you, and think about it and thank God for them. Will you do that? Do that right now. You may have thought of more than one. They may have been alive. They may not be living anymore. If they're alive, tell them. Tell them what you did. If they've already died years ago, God will tell them. And I know they will be pleased. You know what I do every night as part of my devotion? Every night. I go back over in my mind the five churches that I served. And I remember the helpers, the ones who really touched my life. And I call out their names and I thank God for them. Some nights I think of one that I'd missed. I do it every night. Let me tell you one more story. When Rogers was visiting in the home of a writer who was doing a magazine article on him, he visited uh, at supper time and uh, Fred's dad was dying. He was in the final stages of, of life. And when Fred was ready to leave the house, he leaned over and whispered something in the dying man's ear. Well, when they got outside, the writer said to him, what did you say to my dad? And Fred said, your dad is dying. And people who are dying are very close to God. So I asked him to pray for me. He didn't say, I'll pray for you. He said, pray for me. How good is that? 
How good is that? Even in a moment of death, he shared worth and purpose in that man's ears. The story of Jesus tells us the same thing that Fred Craddock taught in all those seminars. In a world full of suffering, please look for the helpers. Look carefully for those helpers. That's where you'll find God. And if you look long enough and carefully enough, you might just become one. May we pray together. Eternal God, how grateful we are when we recall that though we slip, you do not fall. Your everlasting love is our refuge, our strength, and our hope in time of trouble. And we come this day to rest all that we are facing, all of our challenges, difficulties, Whatever it is, it's a heavy part of our heart today. For ourselves or for others, we come to rest those in greater strength than our own. And we come to learn how we can deepen our trust in you and increase our capacity to help each other, to forgive each other, to bless each other. Let your spirit hover over us, and may the grace of the warmth of that presence give light and nourishment to each one of us right now. For we ask it in the name of the one who came and taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you stand now for our closing blessing? <clears throat> Go in love. Go with love. Go because of love. How else will the world know about our good God? And how else will we? Amen.